The Education Channel presents District Digest, an inside look at the Collier County Public School District. First, the latest news. Thanks for joining us. Here's what's happening. Students at Highlands Elementary School are utilizing their leadership skills as they get back to the community. They're taking part in a hands-on activity incorporating math, teamwork, and a lot of heart. We are making Meals for Hope. Um, it is a program that is supported by the NCEF grant. Today we have about 300 kids that are going to be making a fortified macaroni and cheese meal. We expect to make about 40,000 meals this morning. We're um, scooping up some grains while my teacher, Mr. Crary, is putting cheese in the bag. And then we give it to Yesenia and Elizabeth pours in some macaroni. It has to be at 12.3 or 12.4. If it's not, we need to get like, more macaroni and pour it in. They're talking about ratios and adding and subtracting to make sure they're the right amount. We already have almost 5,000 bags. The kids are great leaders and they love giving back to their community. And part of our leadership grant is that they're also not just doing for the school, but they're doing for their community. And this is a perfect way to do it. It's so much better than a spelling test or a math test. It's a wonderful time, especially this time of year, close to Thanksgiving, that the kids are actually giving back. Now coming up on this edition of District Digest, we'll talk about student volunteer hours, scholarships, and financial aid from a guidance counselor's perspective. Then we'll congratulate a high school orchestra and choral director on his recent State Teacher of the Year honor. We'll visit with one of the most decorated swimmers in district history, Gulf Coast High School's Elise Hahn. And finally, we'll learn more about an upcoming annual art event that's fun for all ages. That's all straight ahead on this edition of District Digest, plus... This is Tracy Kohler. Join me for a special feature here on District Digest, coming up in about 10 minutes. We'll tell you what's cool in school. Please stay with us here on the Education Channel, your window to education. On the air on Comcast Cable 99 and online at CollierSchools.com. Attention Collier County Public School parents. Have you ever wondered if your child's school bus is running late on any given afternoon? Well, we've got good news. You can now find out if your child's bus is late on the trip home by going online. Check the homepage of the school district website at CollierSchools.com. When a school bus is delayed by more than a half hour, a late bus notice link appears on the right side of the home page. Click on it to find out. Do you have time on your hands and just love being with kids? We may have the perfect employment opportunity for you as a Collier County Public Schools guest teacher. The welcome guests in our classrooms who were formerly known as substitute teachers. Benefits of guest teaching include the flexibility of working full-time or part-time and on your own schedule. I've always been a stay-at-home mom. I still feel like that stay-at-home mom because of the flexibility of the hours, the non-planning that I have to do. It's ready for me when I come in each day. The so. biggest benefit of all, being able to help students. It's a passion that I have and started it 15 years ago and I'm still going strong because of the kids. Want to feel the passion yourself? You must have a minimum of an associate's degree and be at least 21 years of age. Guest teaching is a perfect fit for a college student pursuing a teaching career and for a retiree, especially a retired teacher wanting to return to the classroom. But anyone is welcome to apply. Do so today at callyourschools.com. It's time for our District Digest School Special. Our first guest today is Allison Ferraro, school counselor at Naples High School. Welcome. Hi, how are you? Thanks for joining us. You're quite welcome. Thanks for having me. We're here to speak about community service, student volunteer hours. Um, a lot of people believe that they're required for graduation. Now, my first question is, is it a requirement of graduation? No, volunteer hours are not a requirement for graduation in the state of Florida. Okay. Um, most times, graduation requirements, again, are based on the academics. Um, mm -hmm. Volunteer hours are to help students with um, obtaining scholarships, mm -hmm. um, mainly the Bright Future Scholarship offered by the state of Florida, mm -hmm. and then also colleges do look for um, civic engagement or volunteer hours. Right, 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 mm -hmm. right. And what are the guidelines of community service? Um, the district has set forth policies that community service hours are to be pre-approved. Okay. They have to be done through a not-for-profit agency. Okay. So if Uncle Jimmy runs a garage, 
and he has you doing oil changes over the summer. <laughs> that doesn't that's count. not community service, that's free labor. Um, okay. So there are, it has to be not for profit. Okay. And students, one of the main things is they're not supposed to engage in any exchange of money. So even if they're working at um, a hospice thrift store, um, they can do stocking of shelves, they can do things like that, but they're not allowed to work the register because the students aren't allowed to be engaged in the okay. exchange of money. Um, well, good to know. So it has to be altruistic in nature. Okay. And you mentioned there's a pre-approval process. Are there procedures for the pre-approval yes. of community um, service? Yes. There is a community service website um, link on the district website okay. and it provides the paperwork. Okay. Um, the steps would be that the student finds a place that they would like to volunteer at. They have a official from that place sign off, you know, certifying, yes, we will accept Susie Smith as a volunteer at our establishment and we will monitor her hours and provide a letter on agency letterhead verifying those hours at a later date. Um, once that is done, the student brings it back to their school counselor where we sign off and make sure we have for record. Okay, wonderful, um, wonderful. And you mentioned community service um, as part of scholarships. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yes, and like I said, um, there, the main thing that we track here in Florida is for the Bright Future Scholarship. Okay. Um, there's three levels of the scholarship and each level has a different re requirement. Um, the Gold Seal Vocational has a requirement of 35 community service hours. Um, the middle level, which is the medallion, mm -hmm. is a 75 hour minimum and then the mm -hmm. academic level the highest level of bright futures has a 100 community service hour requirement so take some time to amass those hours right. and we usually try to have students focusing on it um, there's also other requirements for bright futures which include at least a minimum gpa of 3.0 and some pretty lofty test scores now with um, the district with the state um, starting at a 26 um, composite of an ACT. So again, if you have a student that's, you know, a solid student, but isn't achieving those test scores, isn't right. maintaining the GPA, sometime those students, we want those students to focus on their schoolwork rather than dedicating time for volunteerism right. for the purpose of scholarships. Right, right. Now, is there anything to help parents assist in this process? Actually, there are, each of the high schools have established a financial aid night. Um, for instance, Naples High School on January 13th, we're going to have an actual representative from the Florida Department of Education Great. who specializes in financial aid will come to Naples High in the evening to present to parents and students. Okay. Um, counselors are often in the classrooms helping students do the initial application for Bright Futures. Okay. And then beyond that, in February, um, there's three different places, um, Hodges University, Ave Maria and then Golden Gate High School, which will be doing a College Goal Sunday. And yeah, College Goal Sunday is a time where parents can actually sit one-on-one -on -one with a financial advisor or assistant to help them do the FAFSA. Um, and the FAFSA which I heard is, is very yes, tough. It is in it is based on navigate. individual um, income, okay. and so it is very personalized. And we as school counselors aren't necessarily um, up to date on all the ins and outs. And that's why they were providing some opportunities in the district. Thank and then you. again, each of the high schools will have a financial aid night and they can just refer to the website for Wonderful. those dates. So, so yeah, if you've heard that, check our website, www.colliersschools.com. And I wanna thank you again, Allison, for joining us. You're quite welcome, thank, uh, you. thank you. District Digest continues with a special feature. Joining us now is Samuel Chadwick, Director of Orchestra and Choir at Palmetto Ridge High School. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. We're here to talk about an incredible honor you received. You are the Florida American String Associ Teacher Association's New Teacher of the Year. Congrats to you. Oh, thank you. What does this award mean to you? Well, it really means that I've tried hard and mostly my students have responded to what I've been doing in the classroom. That's pretty much the main thing that it means to me that I'm being recognized for trying new things out in the classroom and students recognizing that it's working and then others in the, the area recognizing that it works as well. Why do you think you stood out from the crowd to receive this award? Um, pretty much my upbringing in music, especially in this area of Colorado County, I uh, graduated from Whaley High School and I went to Florida Gulf Coast University and the teachers there really s use a lot of new curriculum, a lot of new ideas and uh, I've been using that in my class, trying to be very flexible with my students 
try not to be too dogmatic, but listening to what they want to do, how they want to learn, what they want to learn. And I think that's really been a great benefit to Palmetto Ridge High School and the music program. That's great. Explain to me what a typical day is like in your classroom. A uh, typical day, a lot of sound, a lot of noise. Um, it's pretty structured. It's pretty much the way I was in the Naples Philharmonic, the Youth Philharmonic. So I run my rehearsals a lot like they do. So just simple tuning up, going through you know the goals of the day, what we want to accomplish with our rehearsal. And then not just running straight through pieces, but really meticulously chunking through sections that really need the most work, then putting it all together at the end. So, and a lot of student input also. So I try to get the students feelings about how they thought a certain section went, something we could do more, something we could do less. So I try to get as much input from the students as possible as well. That's fabulous. Now your resume clearly shows that you are passionate about music, so what inspired you to take this career path? Um, basically, my education here in Carter County. I had some really good orchestra and choir teachers coming up through Lely High School and East Naples Middle School. And then Judy Evans was my mentor all throughout college. I knew her when I was in high school as well. So just a lot of passionate teachers got to work with me. I really enjoyed what they did and how they affected you know, my career path. So I want to do the same for other youth. So what do you see as the future for your students and for you? Uh, my future is at Palmetto Ridge High School. I want to stay there as long as possible. I kind of want to grow old there. Uh, for my students, I want Palmetto Ridge High School to be on the map as far as orchestra and choir goes. And I think we're making good strides in that effort. Well, wonderful. Congratulations again on this award and thank being you. recognized. We look forward to seeing more awards for you. Um, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. The orchestra from Palmetto Ridge recently performed at our December school board meeting. Take a listen to their beautiful performance. <laughs> District Digest continues as we open your window to education, taking you inside the classroom so you can see what's cool in school. With BYOD, STEM, and today's cool school technology, here's Dr. Tracy Kohler. So, how will we meet the needs of society in the future? Where will the technologists, engineers, and innovators of the next generation come from? 
It is especially important that girls in other underrepresented populations are encouraged to fully participate in STEM-related experiences. Perhaps the future employees will come from Calusa Park Elementary. Calusa Park inspires their youngest elementary learners, those in kindergarten through second grade, with specialized science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM activities in their K-2 STEM lab. And the teachers and students are having a blast learning about the concept of force using racing ramps and racing simulations on iPads. Principal Linda Walcott explains Calusa Park's vision. At the beginning of the year, we had a vision to incorporate more hands-on STEM activities for our students. So we added a STEM resource position, and we've worked on creating a STEM lab for the entire school. And as we've been in that process, uh, our kindergarten teachers thought it would be a great idea if we had a smaller version of a STEM lab available for our kindergarten first and second grade students that had more floor space, lower exploration tables, lower computer tables so that they could really have some meaningful uh, and engaging STEM activities to take place. Using a centered-based approach, students rotate through various STEM activities, all designed with different learning needs in mind. STEM coach John Luciano supports these fantastic Friday opportunities. Well, it gives the students an opportunity from all walks of life, no matter cultural backgrounds or learning abilities or how they come into kindergarten, whether they're reading or not reading, whether they even know letter sounds or if they have language issues, we can still have that differentiation for them because it's a hands-on universal design for learning in this classroom and it gives them accessibility with, as you can see throughout the room, where they're touching things, manipulating things, learning things on discovery education and being able to manipulate what's going on in there. Um, it's also available to them in Spanish and English and in a variety of different levels where we can make it available to them and accessible to all the students in the kindergarten classroom. And now you know what's cool in school. You're watching District Digest on the Education Channel. Our next guest on District Digest is Elise Hahn, a senior at Gulf Coast High School. Elise, welcome to the program. Thank you. First, congratulations. You were just recently recognized at a school board meeting for adding quite a few more state championships to your already long list of swimming state championships, and as well as being recognized for being part of the junior national team. When was it that you knew you wanted to be a swimmer or that you just fell in love with it? Um, I started swimming because uh, my mom was a swimmer in college and uh, she kind of put me into it and I didn't like it at first. So I, I actually ended up quitting after like a year and then I came back and um, we had a coach come to our team. We had a club team switch. We switched names and we got a new coach and uh, he kind of came in and was like, you know, I hope you realize you you can be good. And I was like, all right, and then I kind of like saw at meets that I was performing well and I was placing very well, and so I just kind of decided to start training really hard, and it's worked out pretty well. <laughs> so something kind of clicked. It just felt right. Mm -hmm. Well, and I know you've got a huge amount of support from your parents and from your coaching and from your peers as well, and that's, that's really what it takes. You've got kind of like a group effort mm -hmm. to help support you. Yeah, I mean, swimming, a lot of people do think of it as an individual sport, but I mean, with team and everything, I, I still find it a team sport. With at meets, you're still competing to win a team championship or you know place as a team. So, mm -hmm. and, and talking about that team at Gulf Coast High School, you've been part of the team and you've won state championships every year. You are actually the most decorated swimmer in, in Collier County, mm -hmm. at least Collier County Public Schools. And I'm going to have to look at the list of all these accomplishments. And it's not just one specialty. I mean, you've got the 100-yard freestyle, 100-yard backstroke, 200-yard freelay, uh, or freestyle relay, 400-yard freestyle relay, 200-yard medley relay, 50-yard freestyle. So it's, you're all over the board and you're, you're good at all of it. So what's the secret? Um, I mean, I... I decided when I was in eighth grade that I was going to become homeschooled to train more. And ever since then, I mean, I really just kind of dedicate everything to swimming. I mean, 
you even when you're not practicing you have to think about swimming and when you're not at practice you I mean when you're hanging out with your friends you have to think well I can't stay out too late I practice in the morning or I can't do this or that so it's really just thinking about it all the time and dedicating everything you have to it mm -hmm. and I know we were talking before while the sport while swimming the season may be done as far as school is concerned that we recognize you swim all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I swim year round. There's two different seasons uh, for club season. There's the short course season and long course season. And uh, high school season is part of the short course season. So it just kind of prepares us for our February club championship meet. So uh, high school season just really prepares for club season. That's why I love it. Mm -hmm. And tell us about the junior national team. I mean, being named to a national swimming team, that, that had to be just, that's the top. Yeah, I, uh, I went to Junior Nationals last summer and just didn't, didn't do what I wanted to do. I was there. I was the only person on my team that had gone. It was just me and my coach. And it's kind of just a weird meet for me. And so this year I decided I want to go back and I wanted to do something. I had another teammate with me. So, I mean, that was a big boost. And um, I don't know. I was just sick of not getting on the podium anymore. So I just I went for it. <laughs> So what happens with Junior National Team? I mean, is there a culminating event? Are you going to get to travel? Explain that just briefly to us. Um, the Junior National Team is, there's a series of international meets that um, you'll get invited to. Um, being number six on the list, I don't know if I'll get invited to any of them. If, it's only if one of the other girls can't go. Mm -hmm. But I mean, still being on the nation, Junior National Team, I go to a camp in April. And it's really fun to do the camp with all the USA kids. And it's all 18 and under, so it's all kids my age. And it's just really fun. Mm -hmm. So this is your senior year. You'll be graduating soon. What's next for Elise Han? Um, I will be taking a gap year next year to, um, I'll probably be taking a few college classes and then just training for um, probably nationals next summer and hopefully making not a junior national team, but a national team. And um, Obviously, I mean, going into Olympic trials in 2016. Mm -hmm. And you've already qualified, correct? In 2012, you did had some Olympic qualifying. Yeah, I went to the Olympic trials in 2012. I had two events, and um, hopefully I'm going to be making more. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you're still young. I mean, the dedication that you show and your, your perseverance, obviously, if anybody's going to be able to do it, I think it's going to be you. So I, we look forward to seeing what else is on the uh, horizon for you. Well, thank you. <laughs> District Digest presents a community update. Our final guest today is Matt Knowlton. He is the co-chair of the Chalk Art Street Painting Extravaganza. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Now tell us about this amazing event. What is it? When is it happening? Well, it's put on by the Naples Pelican Bay Rotary Club, which is a part of the Rotary International, which is all the largest service organization in the world. There's a Rotary Club meeting somewhere at every minute of the day somewhere in the United States. Our club is one of seven clubs that is located within Collier County, and we've, this will be our fifth year of having this event. We have this event on Fifth Avenue. It'll be on January 24th and it's from 8 to 5. We shut the street down and uh, for the last three years there's been over 10,000 people on the street up and down it just enjoying the day, the beautiful South Florida weather and all the artists out on the street doing artwork all up and down the street. That's fabulous. Now I'm told that there's an opportunity for students and art teachers to get involved. Explain that to me. Um, yes, we're very excited about that and that's happened each year. We send out information to all the schools and each year we've had art teachers and students come to the event and we've had them from grade school through high school and they we do size, different size squares we do a six by six foot up to a 12 by 12 foot and they get to pick what size square they want to do and what we do is we align them with a business that has sponsored those squares so there's no cost to the student or the art teacher they get to come have a great day their families come out it's again, again the weather's usually beautiful and then at the end we actually even do a judging and there's a chance where they could win prizes win dollar cash prizes and that is based on actually two different categories one is judges we have official judges that go up and down the street and they look at the the different sizes and they pick a winner 
and uh, second place and third place for each one of those. Then we also have voting that goes on by all of the people up and down the street where they buy little tickets and they place those in little tubs for which artwork they like the best. So if a student was to have a, a lot of fans come, they could win in the popular choice category. We use this as a fundraising event and it stay, all the funds stay in Collier County for local charities, but the biggest part of this goes back to the kids. We help sponsor scholarships for kids throughout the county to advance in their schooling. So just to reiterate, the students, when they want to get involved, do they go to the, uh, your website to, to sign up, or how do they? The simplest way is they actually could go to the Pelican Bay website, but all of the art teachers have been provided the documents and how to sign up. And so in the past, it's typically been the art teachers will say, okay, I have nine students, and we'll ask them how many squares that they want to do, whether it's just one or they want to be two or three. And then the art teacher is really who's organized that. But by all means, a student, any individual student, could go directly to our website. And there's a little link on there that they just can get the paperwork and then they email that back in to us and then we will assign them some sponsor and a square where they can come down and do art. That's great. Now have you had a lot of responsive students so far for this year and then years past? Well we're right in the beginning of it right now and I think that we have roughly three schools or four schools, I don't remember the exact number signed up right now, I expect there'll be a lot more. In the past we've probably had as many as 12 schools participate in probably upwards of 25 on a low year up to 40 students and teachers throughout the event doing art. That's great. So what's your favorite part of this event? Uh, well, obviously like a lot of events, it takes a lot of time and effort to put it together, but the day of the event is really special. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. To see Fifth Avenue with 10,000 plus people, students, kids of all ages, up and down the street, enjoying the weather, not inside, not watching TV, they're out there doing art, and either you're the artist and you're getting the enjoyment out of doing the art, or you're just a spectator and you're watching, and we get such positive feedback from everybody. Fifth Avenue loves it because all the shops, they're, they're, it is packed. It's just, it's almost like a fair, you know, mentality, but it's people doing art up and down the street. Well, we are definitely looking forward to this event. It's January 24th from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m., correct? Correct. Got it. We're so looking forward to this. Thank you very much, Matt. Oh, thank you for having me. And we want to thank all of our guests, and we thank you for watching. For Leanne Zinzer, Jennifer Weimer, and all of us here at the Education Channel, I'm Katie Tanner. We'll see you next time. Join us again for District Digest, your inside look at the Collier County Public School District. The show is produced by the District Communications and Community Engagement Department and the Education Channel your window to education.